Um, yeah, so I'm Debbie. I'm just, I'm always curious to know who is familiar with Tilt Parenting, has heard the podcast. Okay, good. So there's going to be a lot of new listeners out there tonight. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name's Debbie Reber. Oh, I want to show you my next slide here because it is a, a picture of my guy. So this is my, um, what I refer to as my differently wired son. His name is Asher. He's 14. He is the inspiration for my creating Tilled Parenting and really taking my whole career path down a road I never intended to go, but here I am. Um, he's differently wired in that he has ADHD and he is gifted. Uh, at one point he had a uh, autism spectrum disorder um, diagnosis as well, sensory processing issues. He doesn't meet that criteria anymore. Um, so he's just a fascinating human. I've been homeschooling him. Uh, I still can't believe when I say that out loud that I'm homeschooling him. Um, we're in our sixth year now. So we had gone through a couple of schools, uh, kindergarten, half of first grade at a private school, another private school for the second half of first grade, and a public school for second grade. And then we moved abroad. and. I was busily calling international schools in Amsterdam and not getting return phone calls. Um, and I soon learned after moving there that they're not really able to or interested in supporting kids who are neurologically atypical. So one of my trusted advisors said, Debbie, if you did not find a fit in Seattle, which is where we were living, she's like, you're not going to find a fit in Amsterdam. You, this is a child who you, deserves to be homeschooled for a while, and we'll see what happens. So here we are. He's uh, in eighth grade now, so, and he's four inches taller than I am. Um, so the plan for the evening is um, to talk about acceptance. That's really kind of at the heart of all the work that I do with parents. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. Um, I am a certified life coach, so I guess that plays in a little bit, but that's not how I do this work. I really um, feel strongly about helping parents have more joy and peace in their parenting lives because if we're raising differently wired kids, and I'm kind of curious if you're willing to show, uh, sh by show of hands, would you identify your child as being differently wired? Um, you know, that could be anything from having anxiety uh, to ADHD, dyslexia, um, or not even a formal diagnosis, but just kind of, you know, a, a more unique, sensitive child. Is that, yeah, okay, good, all right, so. <laughs> you guys are my people. So, um, yeah, so that's really what I'm inspired to do. I know, you know, in my journey, there just weren't a lot of resources out there, and I just felt like I was constantly treading water, and I didn't know how to find things, and that's not okay. Like, are, there are so many kids like ours, you know, I use the statistic one in five. I think that is a gross underestimation of how many kids are actually differently wired. And there's just no reason for our kids to move through the world feeling like outliers or like it's, they're not okay for who they are. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, you should all have a handout. And um, I hope you didn't read ahead. No, it's fine if you did. Um, but my goal is that this evening we'll talk about acceptance, and I am going to leave time throughout for you to just take a minute and jot down some answers, some thoughts, because I hope that you leave this event tonight feeling like you have a new strategy or two or a new plan or a new intention for how you can come to a place of more acceptance, more joy, more peace. Um, with who your child is and how your family is moving through the world. So to get started with that, I would love to just um, encourage you to take a moment and think about what your intention is even for being here. You all showed up. By the way, I'll give you a round of applause for coming out tonight. This is uh, when I flew in, I was like, oh, this is a night to stay home and watch Netflix. So I'm very impressed that you all made it here. So. Maybe just take a minute and set your intention for what you hope to get out of this tonight and how you hope that you are maybe changed as a result of this event.
Oh, that's right. It's a big game. Sorry. Okay. I'm not a sports person, but thank you for reminding me. <laughs> And it's okay if you don't even know why you're here and you were dragged here by somebody else just to <laughs> sit back and uh, see what you get at. Maybe you set an intention to just be open to see what, um, how you might be uh, changed through this or have a different point of view. So I wanted to talk a little bit just about the concept of acceptance and then I am going to share a, a couple of strategies um, that we'll go into in more detail. But, and I would like this to be more interactive as opposed to me just um, standing up here talking. So, um, you know, there's a, quite a number of you here. So if you do want to say something, I always say to talk in Twitter length responses. So, um, but I'm just curious to know um, what acceptance means to you. You know, if you were to really be in a place of, true acceptance with who your child is. What would that feel like? What would it look like? It could just be a couple words. Anyone want to share anything? Love? That your child would just feel kind of loved for who they inherently are? Yeah. Yeah. Can, oh. Okay, an end to the resistance that you feel uh, against their behavior, which I am very familiar with, and we will be talking about that tonight. So um, that is that is a big one because our kids can really trigger us with some of the things they do. Yeah, yeah, being understood, being understood, being loved, us not feeling that resistance, that kind of tug of war. Anything else? Yeah, not judging them. Yep, absolutely. I mean, and these are things. Yeah, go ahead. She might be, but <laughs> no. But I, you bring up you bring up a good point, and um, you know I think acceptance for our kids in society is kind of the uber goal, um, you know. And hopefully, the things that we'll be talking about tonight um, are things that we can also be sharing with our teachers. And I think we do lead the way in many ways of how, and, and we'll talk about that later too, and how we kind of set the tone for how others are going to perceive our children, how we may without even realizing it, be, uh, be contributing to um, stigmas or to ways that they are perceived. So we'll talk about that tonight. So thank you. Um, OK, so those were all really good answers um, about what acceptance is. So um, I wanted to just share 
you know, just personally, what I struggled with, I, and I, I wrote about this um, in my book, but, you know, I knew Asher was differently wired from the time he was a really young guy, just because I, I always say he was more, you know, he was like more intense, he was more physical, more clumsy, more, you know, uh, verbose, you know, just more, and uh, loud. Uh <laughs> and I remember a, a preschool teacher had mentioned the word ADHD, and for whatever reason, I was like, that diagnosis, I was like, no, that, that is not my kid. That is that kid over there who's like running circles. My kid's not doing that. And, and I really, um, I don't know why I had that knee-jerk reaction. And I, you know, my son is, has very severe ADHD. I know that now. And I totally get it. And I think it's part of his brilliance and creativity. And, I, and, it's, and it's fascinating thing to watch him, um, to watch his brain in action and to watch him kind of be in the world. But, um, you know, I think that for a lot of us, you know, that is part of, part of this journey is, you know, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is getting real about, about our own belief systems surrounding differently wiredness, surrounding certain labels, surrounding our kids' behavior. But um, so tonight we are probably going to be talking about things that might be a little uncomfortable. I'm going to challenge you to question beliefs that you might have about things. Um, that, you know, it's not always great. To, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm embarrassed to say that, you know, I, I was, like, judging the other kid with ADHD because he was, you know, so active. He's an awesome kid, but that was my kind of, that's where I was then, you know. It was something that I knew had a lot of stigma attached to it, and I didn't want anything to do with it. And I think it's important that we, that we acknowledge those things. So that's something that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, I wanted to just share with you how I define acceptance. And actually, I'm going to start by doing that by saying what it's not. Um, I do not believe that acceptance is a happily ever after. I don't think that it's like we get to this point and everything's good, you know. Um, I remember working with the parenting coach when I was really, really struggling. And I had just started homeschooling Asher, and I was, I was just in a dark place. Like it was just not working. I was unhappy. He was unhappy, and it, it, it was, it was pretty, it was rough. And I, and I, I was beating myself up more than anything. I was talking to this parent coach, and I, I remember like uttering the words like. I should, you know, like Elizabeth Gilbert was all zen when she was going through challenges. Like, I should be able to be totally zen through this. Like, you know, why can't I meditate more? Why can't, you know? And she's like, okay, first of all, Elizabeth Gilbert does not have children. So <laughs> stop comparing yourself to her. But, you know, I just was going, I was telling myself this story about who I should be as this child's parent. And more than anything else I was going through, was what I was doing to myself and beating myself up for not kind of achieving this total zen-like state right? that I should be evolved enough to, to be in. So I just want to make it clear that I don't believe anymore that that's what acceptance looks like. I think I used to think it was something you just achieved and then you were there. And I've learned that that is not the case. Um, it's not a situation where your child is never going to frustrate you again, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's more about uh, designing um, a relationship with that frustration so it doesn't trigger us as much and, and we don't react in the same way. Um, it's not about, again, reaching the state where we don't get worried or um, scared or a child doesn't embarrass us in public. Like These are all very human things. So um, just so we get real about that. That, that's not the, the transformation we're looking for. This is really about recognizing who our child is, who they inherently are. It's to recognize where we ourselves are kind of getting in the way of who they are, where we ourselves are imposing our own vision for their future, um, where our own baggage is, you know, from our childhood, from things that happened to us when we were younger, is getting in the way of the way that we parent them. And, I, you know, I talk about a growth mindset a lot with our kids. Have you guys heard of the term growth and fixed mindset? Yes, okay. 
So, you know, we all want our kids to have growth mindsets because that's, you know, the gold standard. That's, you know, means that you can uh, know that you can get better at things and you can fail and move on and, and learn. And I think a lot of us as parents need to, you know, own that ourselves too. Um, often if our kid has a fixed mindset, we might be kind of in a tug of war with them because we're, we're, we have the same thing going on. So committing to having a growth mindset as well. So before we get into the strategies that we will be talking about today, um, I guess I wanted to just ask you guys uh, what, get, and I need to see if this is on my sheet here, yeah. So the next two questions on here are where am I in my own journey of accepting who my child inherently is? And then what obstacles are preventing me from being more accepting of who he or she is? So if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute um, and answering those questions, and, I'm, and I would like to hear what you guys think is getting in the way, like what those obstacles are so we can talk about them. So I'd like to, if you're, again, willing to share in just a word or two, tell me um, what, what you think kind of one of your biggest obstacles is uh, in achieving a more accepting uh, state with your child. Anyone want to start? Yeah. Expectations. Your your expectations, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So comparing between an, your other child and then who? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I hear I d I only have one child, so he said the parenting is different. Um, and. Uh, that is something I can't speak to personally, but I hear about it a lot from, from people in the TILT community, um, how challenging that can be, um, especially if your first child is more typical and then you have the second child and you're like, wait, I thought, <laughs> I thought that this child is a reflection of my great parenting, and then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have your hand back up back there? Ah, okay. So you never know, you, um, she said, I feel like I have a different child on different days, so it's kind of, um, you never know what you're going to get, so it can be hard to, to kind of go with the flow. I can totally relate to that. Yeah, okay. 
Okay. So not knowing what to actually accept because there's no diagnosis, but then it also sounds like having that, having a partner who's not on the same page, I know can cause, um, can also cause some just stress in, in knowing how to kind of move forward in a united, aligned way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And for, for um, we'll do some questions at the end too. So if we have time, we can talk about that a little more. And we will talk about what our kind of bigger goals are for these kids. What else? Anyone else? Yeah. And so, okay, so um, just so everyone could hear, um, you have a 19-year-old and, and they're not kind of launching the way that you would hope that they would and um, that is a, that's a challenging situation to be in. Um, and that, we'll, we'll talk about that too, and that I think folds into that expectations, right? We have this idea of what their life's gonna look like after school and, and that's really tricky because it's their life and, and we're here and where does that kind of, how does that work out? Anything else getting in the way of um, accepting your child? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Patience, um, laziness versus trying. And I will say, it's funny you say that, you know, with my son, um, I remember, th I think that can be really tricky when you have a differently wired child and I used to ask this to one of Asher's therapists, like, I can't tell when is the behavior like purposeful or when is it a result of the, you know, at the time, you know, he, he was diagnosed with the Asperger's and he was like, well, if that's who he is, he's always that person. So even if, you know, whatever his behavior is, is, is always going to be related to his wiring. And I was like, okay, that makes sense to me. But it, it, is, it, is, it is tricky. Um, and just to speak to that, you know, I, I love the work of Dr. Ross Green. Are you guys familiar with him? The Explosive Child and many other awesome books. But, you know, his line that I love so much is that our kids do well when they can. And I believe that so deeply. Um, and that's just something I feel like we should all have on replay <laughs> in our brains when our, uh, when our chi children are not doing what we're expecting them to be doing. I'll take a few more and then we'll move on. Yeah. Um, I think I said it was um, obviously over 30% of men. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I get that. Yes. Yeah. So triggering uh, what you see in yourself or traits in yourself. Um, and yes, to use the word mirror is very apt, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a partner also may be displaying the same traits that we find frustrating. So it's big, a frustrating soup. Okay. How about one more? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, so fear of the future, a lot of pressure to, um, to go to the right college or 
for it to look a certain way, um, and that fear is a huge driver for us. Um, we are going to talk about that. And uh, yes, I was just listening to a story on the radio again about that. I mean, it's it's tricky time for for kids. I mean, it's so different than when I, we were in school. I don't know about you, but I it just wasn't the same. It was like you know you kind of picked a college and like it wasn't this like big early admissions and all this craziness that people go through. That has nothing to do with what we're going to be talking about. So, um, so let me just see where I am on here. Um, all right, so we're going to go through some strategies now. We'll go through them one by one. We'll discuss them. I'll give you a little time to write and think about how the strategy might apply in your own life. Um, we'll discuss as we can. I'm just keeping an eye on the clock, and I'm totally on time right now, which is shocking. Okay. Um, so the first th one that we're going to talk about is getting honest with yourself. So I talked about this a little bit earlier when I mentioned my, um, my reaction to the idea that my child had ADHD. Um, so this is where we want to think about you know, what negative, you know, and again, not all of our kids might even have any formal diagnosis, so that, that is not a requirement to answer this question. But, um, you know, what negative or uncomfortable beliefs, if any, and maybe you don't have any, um, do you have surrounding maybe neurodiversity in general? Maybe it, it doesn't even have anything to do with your child. Maybe it's something that you see out in public or you notice or you see um, a child who is differently wired behaving in a way that really rubs you the wrong way, that you find really annoying or um, obnoxious or, or whatever it is. Um, so think about those things. I think it's, it's not pleasant to acknowledge that we have these kind of um, subconscious sometimes reactions to things, but it is really important to understand them because they influence how we see our children. They'll influence us kind of behind the scenes. And I'm a big believer in the idea that we have to really get things out in the open and confront them and, you know, befriend them, you know, whatever, whatever it looks like. But just kind of have an alliance with this part of ourselves because it's just like fear, you know, they say you don't want to stamp down fear. You want to either face it or you just want to acknowledge it. And that's what we need to do here. We really need to know what those things are so we can start hearing them when they crop up in the back of our mind, when we have a reaction to something. Or, or s again, it could be somebody else in public. But we need to know what those things are. So the questions that I'm asking you to answer with regards to, to this are, in what ways, if any, Am I secretly hoping that an issue or a trait or some aspect of who my child is will go away? You know, someone used the word fixing, um, talking about, you know, fear and uh, moving on into the world. And I think we do tend to look, be looking for a solution when we first realize that our child is um, on a different path uh, because so much of of this journey, especially when they're students, is about conforming, kind of fitting in, getting them to the next stage. And, you know, I know this is something I've been guilty of. You know, some of the, you know, Asher is a very chatty person. He will just talk forever. And sometimes it's interesting, sometimes it's not. Um, and I, you know, think just things like that might, you know, used to, to bother me. And um, maybe I thought, or he used to be really loud. And I'd be like, oh, I hope he can learn to not be so loud. So, like, think about what are those traits and that might be really tied to their wiring that are just part of who they are. But they might really get on our nerves sometimes or frustrate us. So um, I want you to take a moment to think if you have an, if there are any kind of traits or issues that you're hoping will just go away. Um, and it's OK to hope that they go away, too. And don't judge yourself for it. Just notice it. And the second question, if your child does have a diagnosis, just check yourself. Do I use the term? You know, some people are really adverse to using labels. 
Um, it makes them uncomfortable to even utter the words. So, you know, if that's you, again, that's fine. Just acknowledge it and think, yeah, you know, this is a, uh, it's hard for me to voice this out loud. It's hard for me to say it in, in front of other people that might not feel safe. Just kind of check in where you are with those things. Any questions <clears throat> about this one in particular? Any kind of thing that struck you that you wanted to share? And it's okay if not. I just wanted to check in before I move on. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So wanting every day to be a good day. And yes, I, I hear you and I, I also relate. You know, I think when you're having really good days, it can be hard to even embrace them because you're waiting for the other shoe to drop or, um, you know, things could go bad the next day. We used to have these regressions that would last months at a time. And I started labeling them. Oh, it's the October regression. Oh, it's the early spring regression. And it's the, the mid-summer regression. And that happened for years after years. And they were, it was so hard to be in them that and you just never knew what you were going to get. So I totally hear that. Any other observations? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so the labels being probably wired because it's positive and optimistic. It, you know, that's my hope. I've gotten feedback that it feels good to a lot of people. Um, and this is one of those like twofold things because I, I completely agree, like disorder, um, even the word diagnosis, right? It's medicalizing things. I was interviewing uh, the president of Eye to Eye, which is a mentoring organization for kids with ADHD. She was like, oh, that is such a better word. Yeah, when I was identified as, as having this neuro difference, you know? Um, and at the same time, because these are the terms that are used, the more we normalize them and are talk about them, then they, they have less stigma. So it's a catch-22. Uh, it's tricky. I, I agree with you. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on to the next strategy. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, the next strategy is to discover where your unhelpful beliefs are getting in the way and then dispute them. So let me talk about what I mean by unhelpful beliefs. So we talked about this a little bit. You mentioned expectations um, for your child. I think this is really at the core of it for most of us because most of, and again, I always have to say this is the case for any parent. I feel like every parent in some way is not expecting their child to be who they are, you know? So we don't own this. Uh, it's just a little more extreme maybe for us. But this idea of, having the expectations here and then reality and there are two completely different places and it's right in the middle here where all the problems happen and so it's really important to identify what are those beliefs if you think about the beliefs are what kind of inform our thoughts and that's what informs our emotions so I have a couple words that I want you to start thinking about how often they show up in your vocabulary. So should, 
is one of those words. I banned that word from my uh, vocabulary. So if you are someone who finds herself saying, you know, he really should be or she shouldn't be or she shouldn't be this upset or he should be doing his homework or he should be able to get out the door, you know, that is a trigger. <laughs> that is a sign that you are arguing with reality and that that belief is getting in your way. And it's, gonna, it's not going to, yes, yes. I'm going to challenge you on that, and I'm going to ask you to hold that thought. So um, just for the re, uh, people on the live stream, um, uh, she mentioned um, uh, her child, 12-year-old, not being able to cross the street and that she should be able to. Um, and so we are going to talk about timelines. That's another thing we're going to look at because that's a big place where we are expecting something that isn't necessarily true, and that's where a lot of unacceptance is stemming from. And I will say that my 14-year-old does not cross the he does not cross safely cross the street right now. He's not ready for that, and that's just where he is, you know. So we'll talk about timelines in a little bit. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, so should is one of those words. Must is another word. Um, have to, can't. You know, all these kind of absolute words. When we are using them in relation to our child, they are going to keep us stuck. So the next question I'm going to just ask you to um, answer, just that first one, how my, my beliefs about the way things should look be keeping me stuck. Um, so just think about maybe if there's one phrase that you might say, hear yourself saying pretty frequently to your child, you know, he should be able to get out of the door on time. He should be able to get his homework turned in. He left with it. What happened to it, you know? So um, think about what that is. Maybe identify a few. And we'll do that for just a few seconds, and then I'm going to give you a little strategy for disputing that. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I have too many pieces of paper up here. Okay, I'm going to just share with you, there's a little chart, because they used to call me the chart queen. I just have to brag a little bit. I really like making charts. This isn't my best work, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so there's this, uh, there are all kinds of ways to dispute thoughts, um, unhelpful thoughts, and, you know, it's, it's basically, this is, from cognitive behavioral therapy. There's also a process that someone named Byron Katie created called The Work, um, where you take a thought that you have, like my child, um, my child should be able to tie his shoes, okay? He's 10, he should be able to tie his shoes. Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing, you could write that in here, that's the thought, that's the belief. And then the second question is, is it really true? And this one, you have to really give yourself a chance to think about it. Like, is it really true? Should he? Like, I is it written in the law? Is this something that, you know, like, I, the purpose of this is just to kind of uh, open up a little wiggle room in your brain to, like, loosen the hold that that belief has on you. So you want to ask yourself, is it really true? You know, no, it, it's not true that he should or that he has to be able to tie his shoes when he's 10. Um, I might like him to, but, um, and then the next, the last question is, how might it actually not be true? And this is kind of a weird thing to ask, but um, this is where, you know, I just challenge you to get a little creative. So using the example of the tying shoes, and I should have thought this through ahead of time, so let's see. How might it be, um, not be true? So it might not be true because um, 
because right now he's a, you know, this child, this 10-year-old is um, really involved in creative writing and completely their brain is way developed in this other area and they have lagging skills in this other area and, they, it, and every child develops asynchronistically and that's just actually perfect, you know, that's just the way where this child is right now. So just thinking about how you know, you can dispute or challenge that belief that you hold so tightly. The idea isn't to convince yourself that, okay, got it, yeah, totally fine with it. It's just to introduce the possibility that you might not be totally right. You know, that maybe, maybe it's okay. You know, it, it's kind of, again, loosening the grip. Because when you start to loosen that, then it won't trigger you as much, you won't react as strongly and then it, we won't kind of go down this cycle of unacceptance. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right, so I encourage you to do this with, um, with different thoughts. And this is something you can do at, at any time. Like if you notice you're saying, you know, you're doing those absolutes, should, must, have to. Um, think, okay, what is the thought? What am I really telling myself? And then challenge it see what you can come up with. Okay, my next strategy, um, we've talked about this a little bit, but I'll just walk you through. Um, this is recognizing where you're fighting reality and reframe it. Um, so, you know, we talked about these habits of getting out the door. We probably all, and I'll give you a minute to write down a list, you probably all have your list of hot button issues, right? Um, mine right now, one of mine is, you know, um, not coming down to the dinner table and making me walk up two flights of stairs to tell them that dinner's ready, um, which now I'm just letting it sit on the table because, no, well, it was, I told you. Um, but, you know, th what are those things that you're, that just always get on your nerves, you know, those things that, those, that could be a little habit, salute. Um, it could be, you know, getting up from the table and walking around and with your mouth full of food. It could be, you know, it just the littlest things. But what are those little things that you're just like, ugh, and you find yourself nagging them about it, saying it over and over again? So we just take a minute and write down. You guys don't have any of these, do you? <laughs> no. Just take a minute and write a few down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I would, so just to recap for the people on the live stream, um, so you were, um, she was mentioning about these habits that really kind of bring up some, some fear response in you because of, uh, of having a, a relative of your husband's, I believe, or a who, who committed suicide. And so um, it sounds, or tried, excuse me. Um, so it sounds like when there's certain behaviors that you're just not okay with because they, they make you kind of extrapolate out what might happen or where you're going down the road, um, which I, I totally understand. And I think, you know, that's, that's part of this. So part of this work is also recognizing that that's really about you. That has nothing to do with your child. And maybe for where your child is um, reacting in a certain way, pounding the piano bench or whatever it is, is completely appropriate right now, right? So, and I will just share, this is something I personally 
struggle with anger. Like, it makes me really uncomfortable. And, you know, a lot of our kids have big reactions, right? The explosive child is, like, my favorite, you know, it's like the Bible in my house. But, um, but a lot of this also has to do with continually checking yourself. Like, that's my problem. Asher doesn't have a problem with anger. Yeah, like, as he gets older and, and he, he doesn't really do this anymore, which is really great, and I'm relieved that he that those explosions have really fizzled out. But, but ultimately, he'll have to find appropriate ways to release that emotion. But for me to judge his reaction, his emotion, because I don't think it's appropriate, or because it's triggering some fear in me, um, is 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 kind of making them feel like they're not okay for who they are and the way they're feeling a need to express. So. Um, we can talk about this more if there's time during the Q&A, but um, I agree with you. It is, it is really challenging, but that's what so much of this work is. It's always bringing it back to ourselves because this, this is why I do this work because, you know, there are so many books out there for, you know, how to help your child be more organized, how to help them with the executive functioning, how to help them with all these things, and those are great, and I have them all, but... This is, you know, I feel like the work that we do on ourselves can be just as, if not more, profound in how our child develops and really gains a sense of self and confidence and security in who they are. And so it is going to have to be like continually questioning these, when we have a, that strong reaction, which is usually a fear or um, an anger, you know, when we have those really strong reactions, that's our cue to say, all right, I got to take a step back. What am I making this all mean right now? And then challenging that. So it's ongoing too, by the way. I'm still doing this work on a daily basis. It's not something that you just, okay, got it. I'm good to go. So it is just this continual commitment to doing the work. Um, I just want to, let me look at this real quick. Um, all right, so we talked about your hot button issues. You, you got some things down there. Um, so my challenge for you right now even, and uh, let's see if we have time to even talk about. Yeah, just choose one of those. Maybe scan down your list and think, okay, what's one of these right now that I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to try to approach this differently. You know, the, the, the thing that in our house was always um, – Asher getting up in the middle of dinner because he would start talking and then he had to get up and he'd have to walk around and you know and my husband would always be like sit down what are you doing sit down you're eating blah 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 and I was like who cares he's let him walk around you know he's got to move there's a kid who's got to move he's excited and that was a really simple thing but that was driving my husband crazy like he was getting so annoyed every night it was and he was you know, disciplining Asher, and then Asher would feel, you know, it was just this whole thing we were doing every night. So we kind of changed our relationship with that behavior, and it's not a big deal. And now he doesn't feel judged in the same way. Yeah. 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 At what point do you, if you stop reacting or working on it, will they ever get it? Yeah, okay. Um, they might not. So, yeah, no, I know, but it bothers you, right? So, I, 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 I hear that. I'm just going to share a story that my, this same kid, of mine is to become obsessed with proper etiquette, okay? I don't know why. He also wears bowler hats. I think he was born in the wrong era, but he, he suddenly has, like, been reading. He just was reading, like, this George Washington translated this French gentleman's guide to proper etiquette. So I am using that. I'm like, well, you know, in, you know, if you really want to be proper, this is the way you, you know, so now he's motivated. So it's also to maybe looking, and maybe we should get this book, I don't know, but um, <laughs> no, 
it's looking for little opportunities, you know. Um, just because they're not doing it now, and maybe their their peers are already kind of demonstrating this more acceptable behavior, doesn't mean that they're not going to get there. Um, I believe that when they're internally motivated, maybe they want to impress someone they're interested in or whatever it is, they might learn really quickly, oh, it's not cool to talk with your mouth full because someone's going to say something to them. And they'll be like, OK, done. So I guess my suggestion would be to not get too kind of caught up now in, in, in just kind of be more relaxed about, OK, there's plenty of time to learn lots of these things. And then look for natural windows of opportunity to just insert little things, little tips, little, you know, that maybe they'll hold on to. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, so she was asking uh, for live stream, um, where is the line between letting them treat us like doormats and accepting their behavior? Um, that's a great question, and, and, I, and I find myself in a very similar situation a lot of the time. Um, and I think it's different as our kids are at different ages, but you know, for me, it's been a practice of learning how to remain really calm and having a, re a boundary for what is respectful behavior and what is and isn't okay. So, you know, and sometimes I lose it too. Like that's a totally human thing to do. Um, and it makes sense, especially, you know, excuse me, I just made your breakfast. Like, come on. Um, but so, you know, there's a couple things. One is to like, when you're not in that situation, try to do some collaborative, proactive problem solving. Like I've noticed that. Sometimes when I make you breakfast, you act in a way, you respond in a way that feels kind of really disrespectful, and it hurts my feelings. So we need to figure this out. So that would be one thing to do at a different time, right? Try to kind of get it out in the open and come up with another plan. But um, you know, I just learn to just with a straight face say, "Oh, actually, I don't um, let people speak to me that way. Um, it's not re respectful." Um, when you can be respectful, let me know, and I'll be happy to bring your breakfast back out. You know, I just, and you might have to say that 10, 20 times. It might not be, <laughs> it's not like they'll be like, oh, okay, sorry, let me try that again. <laughs> like, that doesn't <laughs> happen. But it's a, ma it's a matter of being consistent time and time again, and as much as you can, try to take those breaths. Try to just, you know what, I actually don't let people treat me that way. It's just not a respectful way to be human. I'm going to take your yours at the end, okay, because just I, I'm running behind schedule, okay? Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so I'm a little, let me get caught up here. Okay, so we're going to talk about timeline beliefs. Hopefully you all, did you all pick a, a behavior that you're going to work on? Okay, if you didn't, you'll have a chance at the end to do so. All right, so let's just quickly talk about challenging those timeline beliefs. This is another huge area of non-acceptance. We talked about it a little bit earlier um, with the crossing street, um, and, and uh, you know that really resonated with me because that used to be a really huge concern. It's still a concern. Like, I don't want him to get hit by a car. Um, that would really suck, you know? Um, but, but I was creating so much anxiety around that issue and this is a really tough one, this idea of timelines, because you know we have Facebook news feeds that are constantly telling us what our kids should be doing, and you know the piano recitals and the you know spelling bee, whatever, you know all of these things. And you're like, oh my gosh, like I haven't even gotten my kids signed up for like C Cub Scouts or whatever. Like we're constantly kind of comparing, and that this will really get us into trouble. Um, and so timelines are really complicated, especially for differently wired kids. So many of them, as I mentioned earlier, and as you know, they're so asynchronous in their development. You know, their intelligence here, their, or their social skills here, or here, or 
um, their, uh, their fine motor, you know, some kids really uh, struggle with their handwriting for a long time, um, tying shoes and, um, you know, it's really, this is a tough one because we're confronted every day with what a more typical child might be doing at the same age. So one of the things that we want to do when thinking about this is really go there. Like go to the worst case scenario. Like what, what negative thing like could happen if my child doesn't learn this right now? Like what would be, you know, we need to really kind of get those fears out in the open. Um, and I recognize, and I, I don't want to minimize some of these fears are really big fears. So I get that. And fears of future unknowns, that's a big thing to grapple with. But if we want to think about, you know, what would happen if they learn this later? You know, would that be so bad? Um, you know, I think when we moved to the Netherlands, so that is a country where people are, kids are so independent. You know, I, I would be biking past like uh, probably like three year olds biking to preschool, like next on their two wheelers, you know, next to their parent. Their parent would have their hand on their shoulder to kind of keep them perfectly parallel and they just bike off to school. And, um, and then I, my kid with the helmet on and he was on my bike until about a year and a half ago because it, he just was like, there was too many things to look at and the sounds and it was not a safe situation. But, you know, to be a 12-year-old and not have full run of the city on your bike or, or to still be on your mom's bike, like, forget about it. That's where he was. Meanwhile, he's, you know, can explain whatever, con like, scientific astrophysics concept to me. He's working on different things. He'll learn how to... He'll learn how to navigate a bike in traffic eventually when he's ready, you know, or maybe he won't, and maybe that's okay. Maybe he'll, you know, be someone who takes public transport everywhere. You know, I mean, I think we, we have these ideas of what they should be doing, and then we make it mean something terrible if they're not doing it when we think they should. And so my challenge for you, um, and what I would like you to just take a moment to do, um, is think about, maybe write down a couple little timeline things I just shared with you. The biking thing, he was also a late shoe tire. Um, like, just think about what are those little things where you're like, ah, he should be able to do this by now. You don't have to have eight, but maybe just a couple. Okay, and I want to move on to the next strategy, but I encourage you to take time um, later uh, to just choose one of those beliefs or multiple and fill out my little chart um, where you just ask yourself really honestly, why? Like, why do they need to know this right now? Is the world going to end if they don't figure this out now? Um, what's really the worst case scenario if they don't learn this right now? And how might learning it at another time actually be a good thing. I mean, for me, I w like my friends whose kids were biking all over the city were always, ner you know, they were scared. They were grateful when their kid got home safe because it's the biking in Amsterdam is insane. There's like scooters and I, it's crazy. So um, I didn't have to worry about that. So that worked out pretty well for me. So think about how it actually might be a good thing. Okay, so the next strategy uh, we'll talk about these last two more briefly because I want to have time for questions at the end. Um, so I want to challenge you guys to accept yourself um, and just turn it back on you again. This is, I think all this work is really about us. Um, at the end of the day, um, I told you the story about how I thought I was should be Elizabeth Gilbert, eat, pray, love in my parenting life. Um, 
and that, you know, I really, I hear this from parents all the time, just the pressure we put on ourselves to, you know, to do everything right, um, the pressure we put on ourselves to, to just be the best parent, to not take care of ourselves, you know, um, to do everything for our child. Um, and so when we're judging ourselves for our less than brilliant parenting moments, we're also not in a place of acceptance because we're judging ourselves, which actually means that we're judging our child because if their behavior was different, it would be a better reflection of our role as a parent. So it's kind of a, a very enmeshed relationship here. So just take a minute and just think about if you want to jot one thing down. Is there one area where you feel like, you know, maybe this is something you would only say to your best friend or um, your, your sibling or something like, I really, I, I, you know, I, I should be able to stay more calm than I am. I really, I lose it too much. Or, um, like, just think about where, where are you beating yourself up and how can you be more accepting of yourself? Because, again, this is a, a very human experience and we can actually model wonderful things by acknowledging our own, you know, opportunities for growth. So my challenge for you with regards to this one is to just um, think about it. Like start noticing if you feel like you're uh, beating yourself up and think about how can I be more compassionate um, with yourself. You know, I apologize to Asher a lot, almost on a daily basis, um, which feels really good. You know, I don't think I ever heard my parents apologize to me once. Um, it just wasn't what was done, I guess, in that generation. But, you know, I screw up regularly with him. And when I can come to him and say, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I just did that. That was, that was really not cool. And, and I understand why you got so upset about it. You know, when we can go to our, our children in that way, it just it changes how they feel. It can build a deeper connection, and you, you know, we as parents can let it go and then move on. And so we're accepting our own humanity, our own um, fail, you know, failures, for lack of a better word. But we're just, we're just being human. And again, I think that's such a great model for our kids too, to really learn to accept themselves for who they are, and to know that, you know, one thing, one bad decision doesn't define who we are, and we can all continually grow and work on ourselves. So the last one I just wanted to mention is um, not letting your ego run the show. So sometimes our non-acceptance comes in the form of letting other people influence the way that we react to our kids. So I was very guilty of this. Um, you know, if Asher did something that was quote unquote inappropriate in public, I sometimes would be more concerned with saving face for myself or over explaining what was going on so I wouldn't be judged as a parent. Um, and that is just one more way of not accepting who he is. And I, I believe that our kids notice all this stuff. You know, they know when we're, they know when we're embarrassed of them. They know if we're, um, you know, trying to navigate a, a, you know, our own social, we're prioritizing our own egotistical response in a situation. Um, so I think it's really important and the question that I'm, I'm asking you to, oh, I did these in reverse order, so sorry, my hand's out, okay. Note to self, okay. Um, is to think about you know, how concerned am I about what others think of my parenting choices? If you are someone who, um, who feels judged or finds yourself kind of not, kind of being true to yourself at, as your child's parent, 
in a public situation, that's usually a sign that you're trying to present a, a kind of apparent who you are to the world or be perceived in a certain way. And when we're doing that, we're not putting our, we're not prioritizing who our kids are. Um, so that's something I would challenge you to, to just kind of check yourself on if you're someone who does that. And then also think about how you're talking about your child. I say here to, um, to consider what language can I use when describing my child that leads with strengths. Uh, a lot of us, when uh, introducing our child or dropping them off on a play date or maybe they're signed up for a new camp, we might lead with their challenges. Like, um, you know, I hope he can be really loud. I hope that, you know, um, if there's a problem, just give me a call. Or, you know, like we tend to kind of, we want to warn people of things that might be hard. And again, when we're doing that, we're kind of, we're saying this is a problem, that, you know, these are bad things. Um, so how can we kind of flip it around and, and lead with our child's strengths and present our child to the world in a way that says, you know, my child is really enthusiastic, you know, <laughs> and his energy can be infectious and, um, you know, think about things and that, that's a positive trait, you know. Um, that's, a, that's not a bad thing. So just kind of, again, notice how you're talking about your child in public, how you're introducing them, how you're setting them up, um, and thinking, uh, think about how you could do it in a way that, that prioritizes their strengths and their gifts and, and all the wonderful, brilliant things that they are. Okay, so, so I have one closing challenge and then we'll do um, some Q&A. Um, so I just want, I want you to leave tonight feeling like there's one thing that you want to work on when it comes to fostering a more accepting relationship with your child. So if you would just take a moment the last thing says closing challenge, start now with one having. Just, just write down one thing that you're willing to, you don't have to fix it, just one thing you could even start noticing. I want, or my intention is to, is to kind of be more aware of where I might be using, you know, should language with my child, or you know, whatever it is for you. Just take a moment to do that. Yeah, I missed a slide. Okay. Well, I just wanted to share this so you have contact info. But um, do you all feel like you have a, a plan for one thing? Anyone who doesn't have one thing, I can give you something. <laughs> um, okay, so let's take some questions. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to recap to make sure I get this. So, um, so you want to be more accepting if your child isn't learning a behavior after you, and so you want to think of different ways to help them learn that behavior. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, learning a skill and then either forgetting it or choosing not to use it, and then you've got to go back to square one again. Okay. So um, 
Yeah, so a couple things, like, I'm sure that you know that these kids, like, develop like this, <laughs> you know. There's, like, a lot of three steps forward, sometimes five steps back, and then maybe two steps forward and six steps back. Um, unfortunately, that is the, the nature of a lot of these kids who are, who are different learners. Um, I think getting creative, like, you know, first of all, being like, okay, so, you know, this is the way this child learns, and it seems like they need a lot of different approaches to really get something ground in there. So um, I love that you're getting creative with different ways, you know. Yeah, I guess I. Yeah. I'm not expecting it. Like, I'm still annoyed, I'm still angry. Yeah. Now I'm doing strategies, but I don't feel like, oh, I still love her. No, no I want to fix you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that's the thought then, right? That you that you, I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about um, why is it so important to me that my child can get this skill right away? What am I making it mean that we're still having this conversation three years later? You know, what am I making this mean about me as a parent? What am I making it mean about my child's potential, um, who they are? Am I making this mean that this is a conscious choice and they're just trying to make my life miserable? You know, like kind of trying to uncover some of that. And again, this is this will be a work in progress. I can't give you an answer that will make it all better. But um, you know, going back to Ross Green's quote, "My child would do better if he or she could." And you know, just kind of reminding yourself, you know, no child wants to be <laughs> wants to be, you know, getting in trouble all the time or made to feel like they're they're not getting it. Um, I don't believe these are conscious choices. It's it's you know, it's kind of their their it's it's who they are. So um, just keep doing that work on yourself and notice if you're having that reaction. I think the strategies are great. You know, and I think that's really creative. And I would say, you do something until it stops working, and then you pivot, and then you do something else until that stops working. Um, and your child might just be someone who will need a lot of, might take years until this one habit is, and that could be an executive functioning thing, and it's true for so many of our kids. It just takes so much longer than we wish it would. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. How did you figure out when you were triggered what it was connected to? Because I'll get triggered by things and I can't under, I can't figure out why that's triggering me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I can't stop the trigger. I think it's it's just once you even recognize that this is a trigger for me, um, there are different ways to access it. You know, maybe it's journaling or um, talking with someone. It's someone that you can kind of bounce things off and explore. Um, it's really whatever works for you, and it might be something that you continue to discover over time, get more and more clarity around it. But I think that first step of even knowing, this is an issue for me, and I don't know why, but I know it's an issue. Um, I wonder what that's about. And then kind of um, be open to discovering what it is and try some different avenues to figure it out. And again, once you figure it out, it doesn't mean it's gone, but it really loosens its hold on you, and then you can start to just feel less reactive. And that's really what we're going for here. Yeah. yeah I think it's a good comment. So please OK, I wasn't going to ask anything. I just have uh, one answer, if you can say, uh, to her problem of uh, the morning breakfast. Uh, so, so I think that what had me finding that timeline was uh, telling my daughter that basically, just think about it in this way, that if you would not do that very same situation, would not say that word or would not do that action. 
for the live stream, she was talking about um, using uh, mirroring, um, validating. validating and empathy um, as a way to respond to things going on. I will, um, I, that empathy piece I think is really incredibly powerful. My, um, one of my best friends is a Montessori teacher of toddlers. And I just want her to move in with me because <laughs> when she hangs out with Asher, like she even comes over if he's having a really bad day and he's really angry, she's, she can just stay in this total calm place and she just empathizes like, you were really angry right now. That was really disappointing to you. Like she just, this constant, and it diffuses things so quickly um, and she doesn't get tangled up in it. I think it's easier because she's not living with this person um, and it's not personal. It can so often feel personal to us as parents. Um, and often, you know, our kids save the good stuff for us. But, uh, but that empathy piece um, is, is really powerful. Yeah. So I am having a hard time with not presenting my child because it takes so much energy from the rest of the family. And my other kids are starting to resent him as well. I just don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> even admit it. Yeah, no, I love that you said that, and I'm sure it's something that a lot of people are relating to. So for live stream, um, she mentioned that she fe is starting to feel resentment towards her child. Um, and, and I think that that's normal. I think it's good to admit it. I think it's good to be like, okay, this is, you know, this is where we are right now. Not make it mean something about you. It doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It doesn't mean that you are failing in any way. It means that you are really in touch with your emotions and you're honest with yourself. And just kind of recognize that this is gonna be an ongoing thing. And I wish I could say, do this, this, and this, and you know, but even getting in touch with that emotion and not pushing it away I think can be the most powerful thing. And it feels awful when you're in that because it feels wrong. Like as a parent, I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, be experiencing this. It's, um, but some of the behaviors that we're dealing with are really hard. You know, I, it's so, I, I feel like I even blacked it out when I, you know, when I was writing the book, I had to go back and Whew. Like I, you know, I was. I found emails I sent to my mom at two in the morning. I found, you know, all kinds of correspondence with teachers, and you know, just a lot of painful stuff. And, and it's um, when you're in that, of course, why wouldn't you feel that? You know, it, it's painful. Um, you know, I would say it doesn't last forever. Those phases don't last forever. And prioritizing yourself, accepting yourself, but also taking yourself is really important if you're feeling that way. I'm a big self-care proponent. I'm really, um, like, I will do, like, no matter what is going on in my house, I will take what I need, even if it's just a five-minute walk around the block to be alone. You know, I just do what I need to do. And so I don't know if you have a plan for yourself or how to rejuvenate and recharge yourself when you need it, um, whatever that looks like, but I would encourage you to think about too, and know that this is not going to, you're not going to be in this space forever. Actually, well, I, I used to go on these long walks with Asher, and so 
Honestly, I don't even know what he talked about half the time, but <laughs> he would talk the whole time. And if he loved, he, he, loved, he just wanted to talk, right? Um, so I gave him that space. So maybe thinking about, you know, setting some guidelines, or maybe at dinner, if you guys have dinner together, maybe it's, you know, we, we have, there's, at least I'm gonna start the timer now, we're gonna have 10 minutes of screen-free conversation. What should we talk about? You know, um, we just got a little, we got as a Christmas gift um, a deck of, like, conversation prompts, you know, or, you know, just kind of get creative, but, but also giving them time to do that, where it's like, you know what, all right, it's time now. You have 20 minutes, go for it. I may not understand what you're talking about. I'll jump in if I can, but you know, they probably don't really care if you're a part of it, right? Right, I feel like they can be helping us. You know, it's like, now, it's, know, there's no interest to go to the pool, there's no interest to go to the Yeah. You know, it's yeah, I mean, anxiety from school, and you know, the outside world is so different. I mean, you know, if you listen to my podcast, you know that, you know, there's a lot of great stuff happening in my house. And my husband is a gamer. Like, I was doomed from the start. So. <laughs> Um, luckily, it's now something they, they're doing together, and then I leave. But um, <laughs> but it is a battle, and you know I think it's just continually trying to set you know guidelines. Like you know I recognize this is a really big part of your life, and that's awesome because I think screens. Are, I think what they can get from so much of their screen interaction is really incredible. Um, and saying, as long as we have balance, I'm cool with it. I mean, this is my approach. We're not, I, I tried screen limits for years and it nearly brought us down. Like our family was almost destroyed over timers and warnings. And I was just like, I can't do this anymore. So just kind of having some guidelines. We're, and making it a family thing. We're a family that we need to get exercise and get out every day for 15 minutes. And that's just what we do. And I know it can be hard if you haven't established that to like start something new, but you know what? You can just say, hey, I realize I should have been doing this all along, so moving forward, this is what we're doing. Let's design it together. And just try to set some guidelines. Not strict rules, but more like, I like the word guidelines. So. How are we doing guidelines? Is that one more question? I just want to say thank you. Um, this is really fun. This is my first speaking event since I moved back to the. Oh, oh it's so nice. This is like. Um, you know, being, uh, being, being abroad, I was like kind of in this little bubble in my little office and I didn't get to interact. And I really did not want to move back, I will say. But I, I knew that I'd get to do more of this, and this really makes happy just to kind of be in this space so thank you so much for coming um check out my podcast if you if you haven't already and um and there's an evaluation i'd love to hear any feedback you have i think you might have it already um and uh, yeah so thank you thank you debbie again um i see another lot of you have the book already a lot of these folks were supposed to be here this evening, and unfortunately they had uh, something come up today that made them unable to come. But we're going to send out a link um, tomorrow to everyone who was here, and if you purchase the book through that link, then you'll get a, sign of a copy that has a plated signed copy from Debbie as well, um, if you would like to take your advantage of that. And highly recommend the book got a lot more practical strategies and just more wisdom and I think some of just comforting um, affirmation of the things that we are all going through. In addition to being the executive director here, I am a parent of a differently wired child, so I thank you personally for reminding me of some strategies and coming to greater acceptance of my own child's development and timeline, which um, I may be driving him to work his whole life, but <laughs> we'll get there. Um, of course, yes. So come up. I know that Debbie would be happy to talk to people, sign books. And I will do one final plug for the community education series. We have four more events um, this spring. You can pick this up going up. We've got, uh, we'll be at the Museum of Life and Science this Sunday. And hope that you'll come by and see us at the community day in Durham. We've got, if any of you have children who are struggling with anxiety, teenagers, we have a film screening called Angst that we're really excited about. And then we have two uh, ADHD focused topics. One is about Dr. Patricia Quinn is coming to talk about gender differences in ADHD, which 
she's, a, she's one of the leading experts on that topic. And then the Duke Center for ADHD will be here in March um, talking about diagnoses and understanding diagnoses and treatment. So pick up the flyers. You'll have our emails. Uh, ask me if you have any questions. Thank you again for coming. I hope you make it home for the game if you're a fan. <laughs> Go Thank you.